Hi, and welcome back to First Year Microeconomics. We're in Mumbai, India, to talk about markets. Let's continue with our discussion of comparative statics, and in particular, we're talking about the effects of government policy on the price that people trade at and the amount that people trade. In the last presentation, we looked at agricultural price supports and showed how that may push up the price that farmers receive, but reduce the amount that farmers sell. In this presentation, we're going to start talking about price ceilings and price floors. First, let's start with a definition of a price ceiling. That's the situation where the government passes a law but says it's illegal to sell above a specified government price. So a price ceiling is a situation where the government sets a maximum price that people can sell the product for. They could sell it at a lower price if they wish, but they can't sell above the price ceiling. In contrast, a price floor is the situation where the government says that it is illegal to sell below the government specified price. So a price floor is a situation where the government sets a minimum legal price for a product. It's legal to sell at a higher price, but it's illegal to sell at a lower price. Before we start looking at a price ceiling or a price floor, let me just remind you of our simple accounting identity that we had in the last presentation. In any market, at any time, whether you're in equilibrium or you're outside equilibrium, voluntary trade means that you can't sell something unless there's a buyer and you can't buy something unless there's a seller. Voluntary trade means that at all times, the quantity sold must be identically equal to the quantity bought. This identity has an important consequence. It means that the short side of the market always rules. It's the minimum of the amount people would like to sell and the amount people would like to buy that is the amount that is actually transacted in a market. So, let's look at an example of a price ceiling. Here in Mumbai, and in India more generally, for many, many years, there has been a thing called rent control. Rent control is simply a price ceiling on the amount that landlords can charge tenants. Here in India, the ceiling was set many years ago and certainly hasn't kept anything like pace with inflation. Further, tenancy is inheritable. So, if the original tenant dies, the tenancy can be passed on to the children at the original fixed rental price. Let's see what that means for the rental market in Bombay. Let's start by thinking about what the Mumbai rental market might look like in the absence of rent control. We would expect the market to move to equilibrium where demand and supply for properties cross and that might lead to a rent of say 6,000 rupees per month on an average property and around 5 million properties rented in Mumbai enough to house the entire population of just over 20 million people. But what happens when the government introduces its price ceiling, its rent control laws? Well, let's say that the government sets the maximum rent that a tenant can pay or a landlord can receive for a property at 2,000 rupees per month. Notice that at this lower price, landlords are only going to want to rent out a smaller number of properties, 2 million properties, although tenants, the buyers, would like to rent far more properties, say 8 million properties. This difference between the 8 million properties that buyers would like to rent and the 2 million properties that landlords are happy to rent out is our level of excess demand. It's 6 million dwellings in our example here. Now what normally happens is that if we've got a situation of excess demand, the price would start to go up. But it can't. It can't go up because it's illegal to charge more than 2,000 rupees per month on a dwelling. So what happens? This is where our accounting identity comes in. If trade is voluntary, the short side of the market will determine the actual level of trade 
And in our example here of a price ceiling, it's the supply side that is the short side of the market. So, at our rent control price of 2,000 rupees per month, what's going to happen? Well, the short side of the market will determine the level of trade. That's the supply side. Landlords are only willing to rent 2 million properties per month. Even though buyers would love to be able to rent more properties, they can't because no one's willing to rent the properties to them. So the market equilibrium will be a price of 2,000 rupees per month for rent and only 2 million rental properties leased out in Mumbai. And that's not nearly enough to house the entire population. So our key point is that we get stuck below the equilibrium price and below the equilibrium quantity. Why do we get stuck there? Because our dynamic assumption that when demand or the quantity demanded exceeds the quantity supplied, price goes up because that dynamic assumption no longer applies. It no longer applies because it's illegal to raise the price. The excess demand cannot push up the price because it is illegal to raise the price. That leads to a low price, but it also leads to a shortage. A simple corollary is that if the government had set the price ceiling above the market equilibrium price, then the law would actually not have any effect. Let's just check that. Let's suppose that the government set the price ceiling up here at 9,000 rupees per month for a rental property. Remember that the law says that you can't set a rental price above the price ceiling, but there's nothing preventing you from setting a price below the price ceiling. So what will happen? Well, if we actually had a price of 9,000 rupees per month for rental properties, the amount that sellers, the landlords, would like to rent out is much higher than the amount of people that want to rent their properties there would actually be a situation of excess supply. That would start driving down the price, but the law doesn't prevent the price from dropping. So our prediction is that if the government actually set a price ceiling on properties of 9,000 rupees per month, then would actually end up at our equilibrium price of 6,000 rupees per month and 5 million dwellings being rented out in Mumbai. In other words, the price ceiling in this situation would not have any effect on the market. The harm is done when the government sets a price ceiling down here at 2,000 rupees per month because that's below the equilibrium price. So, what are the consequences? of the rent control laws in Mumbai and in other cities in India. Well, they're illustrated by the picture on this slide. Mumbai is home to Asia's biggest slum. Now, the people who live in that slum, many of them have jobs. They're able to afford some of life's luxuries, although their living standards by at least the standards of Australia and other developed countries is pretty miserable. But the real reason why they end up living in slums is because the rental market doesn't work. There simply aren't rental properties available for the slum dwellers. Why? Well, because of government policy. Our prediction is that the price ceiling on rents in Bombay will lead to a shortage of rental property, and that's exactly what we see. But the people have to live somewhere, and that's why there are slums. Now, the few people who are able to get cheap rental properties, they're pretty happy about the laws. But as you can see by the picture on this slide, there's a lot of pain and suffering caused by these ill-thought-out government policies. One of the roles of economists is analysing these types of policies, pointing out their failures to governments and trying to push for change, trying to get better policies so that we can prevent the sort of suffering that we see in the slums of Mumbai. Thank you very much for listening.